Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all well and um, surviving or thriving in the lockdown. Um, I say uh, surviving is one of the options uh, to that. Um, just before you all came on, um, I heard Matthew uh, telling his daughters to get off the internet um, to preserve his bandwidth. Um, and I'm just waiting at any stage for um, the noise of my kids to start thundering around upstairs. Um, so apologies in advance if that happens. Um, the, um, thank you very much to the PLA and to Paul Barker of Gowling in particular um, for inviting us to present this seminar on the 54 Act. Uh, Paul is chair of the regions for the PLA and it was him who um, is responsible who, for uh, organising this. Paul wanted to be able to introduce the seminar uh, himself today and to say a few words but IT issues have meant that that's not possible. Um, he's asked me to welcome you on his behalf. This was conceived as a seminar for the Midlands region only initially and then it was opened up to the PLA membership more generally and uh, we've now got to the stage where well over 400 people um, are due to attend which is absolutely fantastic. It um, either means that the 54 Act is a very popular subject or perhaps that, that everyone has finished their box sets on Netflix by now and are just casting around for anything to do. Um, Paul has asked me to let you know that the regional committees are working on other webinars um, generally. Uh, they will be open to all members and he's asked me to say that if you have any ideas for topics uh, for, that, that you'd like to see dealt with in a future webinar, uh, then you should email the chair for your region and apparently the details for that um, are on the PLA website. So by way of very brief introduction, um, I'm Geraint Wheatley, I'm joined by Matthew Hall and Matt and I are both members of the King's Chambers property team. Uh, King's has got uh, chambers in Manchester, Leeds and Birmingham, for those of you who don't know us already. Um, as a whole, we've got over 100 members and the property team has well over a dozen specialist property lawyers from silks all the way down to junior juniors. Uh, Matt was called to the bar in 1999. I was called in 2001. Uh, briefly, by way of housekeeping, you are all muted as standard at the moment, it would be unmanageable otherwise with such numbers. It, it, it avoids uh, interference with sound and so on, if, um, which, you can have, which you can have if uh, more people are, on, uh, are unmuted. We're happy to take questions, um, but on the chat function only. Again, it would be unmanageable, I think, if we were trying to, to, to do that orally. And if you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screens rather than the Q&A function, then at least we'll have a single place to look at and to monitor. You'll see that, that there are a couple of different chat options. Messages can either be directed just at, at Matt and I as the panellists uh, or to everyone. It's a matter for you as to which you choose. We intend to pick up those questions at the end of our respective talks. And in case time doesn't permit us to get through those questions, if you include your email address alongside your question, um, then we'll be able to pick it up uh, after the seminar. The PLA will be emailing full handouts to you uh, in due course following the seminar, so don't feel the need to um, scribble down all of our pearls of wisdom uh, as we go. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Matt to talk about rent. Well, hello everyone. Um, uh, my talk uh, this afternoon is on rental valuation uh, under the 54 Act. Um, I think it's crucial really for anyone dealing with commercial lettings to understand uh, how rental valuation works under the 1954 Act. Um, not only, I think, as a solicitor in order to present a case at court, um, but also because any negotiations for a new lease are done against the backdrop um, of the Act. Um, in particular, uh, I think we all need to be able to uh, evaluate and deploy the expert evidence uh, about 
rental valuation in order to properly advance our clients' interests. Uh, in this talk, what I'll do then is I'll look firstly and briefly at the basic legal framework for rent under the 54 Act, uh, then just move on to um, the expert evidence and how best to uh, coordinate and to present that. And then finally, uh, I'll have a look at how the coronavirus uh, pandemic might be affecting the, the, that exercise. So firstly then, just to look at the legal framework, rent is dealt with under section 34. Now, um, interestingly, unlike the uh, duration of the new tenancy, uh, which has to be set according to what's reasonable in all the circumstances, and the other terms which have to be set just having regard to everything, the Act fixes the way that the rent is set. It's a market rent. So in other words, it's a matter when it comes before the judge of valuation uh, rather than uh, a discretion. Now that means that a judge in the county court hearing an issue on rent becomes in effect a valuer for the day. Now just looking at the section here you'll notice that it only refers to a willing lessor. Um, now Obviously, there is also presumed to be a willing lessee. And if you needed authority for that, I think it's probably fairly obvious. There's a rent review case which decides that that's the case. But otherwise, of course, there couldn't be an open market because that presupposes a, a lessor and a lessee. Then the other point is that these, the, the willing lessor and the willing lessee are entirely hypothetical. Uh, now, you might think, well, that's an, another obvious point. However, in my experience, <clears throat> it is tempting for your clients to want to put in factual evidence about their own situation. Uh, one case in particular I remember doing uh, quite a few years ago now, it, the tenant was a, a national cosmetics chain, and it had its marketing director put a witness statement in saying, well, you know, nobody buys shampoo anymore in the shops. It's all gone online. And so our profits are down. And we had evidence as well from the estates director. This is factual evidence saying, well, because of all of these problems, we're getting some really low rents on our other um, negotiations. We're getting short terms and so on. Now, in my view, unless that information has a direct bearing on the demand for that property in that town, it's irrelevant. Uh, just, uh, to, just looking at the um, test again, sorry. It, you'll see that the rent has to be ha uh, set having regard to the terms of the tenancy other than those relating to rent. So the other terms have to be set first before you get on to rent. I just thought I'd make a couple of points about the impact that some of those terms can have on, on, on the rental inquiry. Restrictions on user is a, is a case in point there. There are two nice older cases which demonstrate what I mean here. First one, in the Aldwych Club case, the tenant was the Aldwych Club. It was one of those old fashioned gentlemen's clubs, I think. Um, and uh, it was applying for a new lease um, in its uh, lovely building uh, near Covent Garden. And what it said was, well, uh, it asked the court to modify the user covenant so that the building could only be used as a gentleman's club. The reason why it wanted to do to introduce that that um, stricter term was because with that restriction, the rent having regard um, uh, to the other terms uh, to that restriction would of course be lower than it would be if the if the building could be used as offices as well, and there, and in fact the development of the building for offices was on the cards. Planning permission had been granted. The flip side of the coin, really, of, of that case is the Charles Clements uh, case. So Charles Clements London Limited is a cutler's or was a cutler's. It made the sort of posh cutlery sets that your grandparents would be given for their wedding and keep in a, a drawer and never use. Um, 
The lease restricted the use of its premises on Regent Street to retail cutlery. And what the landlord said was, oh, well, that stymies this, uh, this property in, in our hands. Relax the restriction, make it so that we can use, it can be used for other purposes with our consent. And again, uh, the judge, uh, it, well, in, in both those cases, the, the attempt to modify the restrictions failed. The, the tenant couldn't seek a stricter restriction to get a lower rent and the landlord couldn't open it up to increase the rent. Um, the, as I've said, the, um, the section, section 34, refers to an open market. What if there's no market? Um, that might be particularly pertinent to ask now. Um, so the, now there's a rent review case on, which answers this question. It's, in fact, I've referred to it just before. Um, although there has to be assumed to be a, an open market, that doesn't mean that the judge can't find that the market is dead. And as a result of that, that there's no prospect, realistically, of a tenant paying anything other than a nominal rent. So um, with those brief points in mind, just on, on, on the legal framework and how it affects the rent, I'm going to move on now to, to the evidence. As I say, uh, when a case comes before a judge, it's effectively, an ex on rent at least, it's an effectively just an exercise in rental valuation. So the choice that you make of who your expert should be may well be, if you think about it, the most important choice that you make in the litigation. The first thing that I often come across as an issue is, can the, an employee or an agent of the client, be that tenant or landlord, be the expert? And the answer to that is, yes, they can. Um, but in my view, there are two, two principal reasons to be careful about that. The first is that, uh, as, we've, as we've all probably been exper experienced, um, surveyors who are agents uh, already uh, may well have been negotiating in the run-up to the proceedings about the rent. And sometimes surveyors can, in the course of negotiations, put forward propositions and arguments which might I don't know how to put this tactfully, they might not stand up to full forensic scrutiny. What they often say is, oh, well, I put forward that argument for negotiating purposes. So you need to be careful, in particular, I think, with rent, if there's been any open correspondence about it between the two agents, about arguments having been, been put forward, which actually a surveyor doesn't think really would stand up in court. I think, secondly, the more general point is the more long standing and close the relationship between an expert and, and the party, uh, the more it's likely, I suppose, to undermine the judge's view of the expert's independence. Even if it's not a case where the opposing side's counsel or advocate can put it directly to the expert that they're just making it all up and they're fibbing. And they're, they're, in, they're in their party's pocket. Nevertheless, I think it does probably influence a judge in the back of their mind that the, 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 uh, the evidence of, of somebody who's got a long standing financial relationship uh, with a client might be tendentious. So, on balance, I think it's always better to go for someone new when an expert's appointed. And in fact, I think that opens it up a bit because. I think a, bit, a big factor in all of this is having local knowledge. Ultimately, in my view, a surveyor has to ask the first question is, who, who is it that was, would be renting this property? And a person with local knowledge of, a, of, of the commercial environment, or the, if it's a shop, the town centre in question, I, I think will come to the case with an advantage. Um, I've mentioned there the f familiarity with the relevant RICS materials. I suppose that goes without saying. And finally, just, you know, um, the way that reports are written, sometimes in my experience, doesn't, there's a bit of a deficit of just common sense. Judges don't want to be blinded by science. Um, 
A judge sitting in Manchester, for example, doesn't need three and a half pages at the beginning of the report describing Manchester as a, a busy city, you know, served by the M6 and the M62 motorway network. Um, the, there's a, a real importance on focusing on the primary points, I think. Um, clear exposition and really knuckling down on the most relevant comparables. And so with that in mind, I just come to the valuation exercise itself. Um, there's no better summary of what, how it works than the judgment of Mr. Justice Lewison, as he then was, in the Marklands case. It's about a page long. Uh, I've summarised it here. The valuation proceeds normally, at least, by way of an ana analogy, his lordship said. So the first thing you've got to do is look for real life transactions which are closest in time uh, and most comparable to the subject matter proposed letting. First thing you've got to do though when you find another, another uh, find a comparable is to adjust for size and that's where the it's a mystery part of my title comes in and I'm just going to break off from Mr Justice Lewis in there just to give you a slide just to explain if I can, how this works. Some of you may be already be from very familiar with this, but just briefly. Zone A is the bit at the front of the shop, and these are 20 feet subdivisions moving back. So the valuer divides a shop up going back into 20 feet uh, areas. And then the, the, in terms of zone A, reflects a halving back so that the front of the shop is much more valuable than the, the parts to the rear. So zone A, there I've got that in orange, the orange bit would be counted as the full 350 square feet. Zone B, half of that. Zone C, half of that. And if you know the rental from the comparable, then that divides into the modified uh, floor area to provide a rent per square foot in terms of zone A. Now, as I say, what this reflects is it's for retail premises mainly, and it reflects an assumption that the front of a shop is just worth so much more than the bits in the middle and to the rear. And that's because, as we all know, people are attracted in by the frontage and research shows that people spend 90% of their time in the first, the, the opening bit of the shop. Now, immediately, of course, one comes up against problems. This is because this is a blunt instrument. The first thing is you may have a shop which isn't quite so simply um, set out as my simple example. So my red arrow here, if you look at that bit at the bottom and assuming again that the entrances are on the left, there's a bit that sticks out down there that's in zone A which is clearly useless. It's masked from the front of the shop that you can't use it for, for, for anything probably other than storage or as a corridor. By the same token, if you look at the bit at the back, which will be in zone D there to the right, there might be another entrance there or a big window or something making it more valuable than the ITSA um, analysis would, would suggest. Just to go back then to, uh, to, to what Mr Justice Lewison said, you, you apply your ITSA but then what you've got to do is to adjust to take account of particular features other than the size of the, of the premises themselves. Now, what I thought I'd do here, and I don't know if this is going to work, and I'll move quickly on if it doesn't, but I've got some pictures of some, uh, some shops. Now, in this, in this uh, area, we all need to think like valuers. So what I thought was, if uh, now, where's the chat function? If anyone wants to put on here, what special feature of this shop, if you can write it on the chat, uh, what what's the special feature of this shop shown in this photograph, which might uh, either enhance or reduce the rental value of, the, of, this, uh, of these premises? I'm just trying to open up the, the chat. I can't. See where it is. Have you got Geraint? Is that is it saying return frontage? 
Yep, we've got, um, everyone seems to be getting that double. Okay, double right, well, I better move on pretty quickly yeah. then. Yep. But, right, if they've got some excellent. Knowledgeable crowd. There's another, there's another return frontage, but I don't know what anyone thinks. Would that return frontage increase or reduce the rental valuation of this shop? Is the question. Go right into that. I'm not sure I can see my chat, so perhaps you could just report back. Yeah, we've, we've got um, variation here. Some saying increase, some saying reduced because it goes down to a basement or because of a car, the car park. Yeah, there's no, it doesn't really go anywhere, this return frontage. And sometimes you can have, sometimes a return frontage can lead to a sort of excess of glazed area, which limits your options for dealing with the interior of the premises. So the, to me, I don't think that looks like a shop which particularly benefits from that return frontage. Next one, very beautiful premises there. Can anyone guess uh, what feature might apply to that shop which could uh, reduce its rental valuation? And again, if I could ask you, Geraint, just to uh, compare for me there, if anyone's still... We've got suggestions of that it might be listed, that there's no parking, um, yeah limited window so it's the hard frontage point i think yeah yeah all those right. yeah. It, was, it was listed that i had in mind okay next one one of those answers may have given you a clue was just just assume that that one's not listed okay well look that i i put that one in because that's hard frontage so again now it may be of course in all these circumstances it may be that um, these things don't make a difference in the circumstances concerned. So for example, with the listed building, the fact that the building is so unbelievably beautiful would be a real bonus on New Bond Street if it was a, a, a very high-end retailer. It's less um, of, a, 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 of an advantage if it's in a, 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 a secondary location or a lower, a lower rent area. Equally, you know, here's the last one I had, a shop that's on a hill. That, that wouldn't be so much of a problem in the town of Keswick, for example, where every other shop is a walking and climber's shop, and you know, where the customers don't mind walking uphill by definition. It is a problem in a town with a very elderly population. All of these things, in my opinion, need to be brought out in the expert evidence and made explicit. Once you've got the comparables up and running, there can be a danger in my experience that they, that they all become a bit of a jumble. In presenting the case before the court, um, in, my, in my view, a list of comparables is essential. Um, now, judges love schedules, particularly if they've got some, an area to write on or type in their own comments. You could do this two ways. You can get your own expert to do a list of the comparables and get them to order them in, the, in, in, in order of the most uh, relevant and the most important. The other way of doing it is to have a joint list so that they're all there on one sheet before the judge as a trial. Um, now, you'll notice there that the second column in that list is the transaction type. And the valuer will tell you that there is in fact a hierarchy of transactions with open market lettings at the top and apparently court decisions being at least probative on the question of rent. Once you've got your comparables, then, you, then you're gonna use the services of this guy. Now he's not some sort of a hip, hipster or member of Mumford and Sons, this is the, uh, the man who invented the maps, which uh, are very useful still uh, in pl plotting uh, town centre areas. This is for retail, really. So that's a Goad plan. They're now provided by Experian. Um, Charles Goad was a 19th century cartographer who invented this type of plan for the purpose of insurance companies. He was a Canadian 
uh, surveyor and cartographer. I've used as my example here the uh, central London um, Covent Garden and by the red apple, red arrow at the bottom, that's in fact, I think uh, somewhere near there, that's the Apple store. In fact, I think actually my arrows have become slightly um, um, out of sync. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There, the Apple store is down at the bottom. Probably people know where it is. That is a different um, retail zone entirely to the to the um, to the part where the yellow arrow is up by that big um, office building, the Chemical Bank building, where you can see if you can just look carefully, it's the Royals Indian Restaurant. They're probably only about three hundred yards apart, but the but in retail zoning is absolutely everything so what in in that sphere the surveyors will be looking at is the footfall of the premises who's going where where they might even condescend to issues of where zebra crossings are uh, only a few hundred yards difference can make a massive um a difference in the, in the rent so Ideally, if you're presenting a case, if you can, if it's a retail case, the, um, the comparables that you've got on your list will be plotted on a GOAD plan so that the judge can see where they all are and can, and can consider the arguments about their relative merits in coming to his or her decision. Finally, on, on this, really, the, the, um, obviously, the the valuation surveyors are going to be very interested in what the retail environment is like or the, the commercial environment is like and there's a fabulous online resource for this freely available to everyone which is the RICS UK commercial property survey it comes out quarterly it's a sort of three page document I don't, can't put it all up here but it has um, little sound bites up from the regions and from sectors, from uh, member surveyors all around the country. Um, now, this is the most recent one, um, perhaps not surprisingly, commercial market outlook hit by coronavirus outbreak. And what you get in this is, um, and as I say, you, sh you know, you, we need to be getting into all of this ourselves if we're going to be presenting these cases. It's no good just letting the valuer do it him or herself. Um, because it's fairly self-evident what these things show. Supply and demand, this is the most recent. Look at the way in 2020, occupier demand has just gone straight down. Um, it hasn't seemed to have affected the availability yet, but of course the impact of the pandemic will have only hit mid-quarter. The sound bites offer really good um, cross-examination material, by the way. So if you've got a surveyor on the other side who's painting a rosy picture, for example, that you don't agree with, it's great for barristers, uh, this resource, to be able to pull out of their pocket and say, well, actually, I know you say this in your report, but the RICS publication says that actually things are, are looking rather grim. So that's another thing to, to, be, to be aware of. Finally, just then, um, uh, just in relation to this, what, what about coronavirus and where we are? I already mentioned earlier on about, well, what if there's no market at all? In theory, a, 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 um, a judge could find that a rent was, uh, the market rent, as at the relevant date, was only a nominal rent. Um, when is the relevant date though? Because under section 64 of the Act, the valuation date is actually three months after the trial. So you're always looking ahead. Now at the, at the moment, um, because, it, because of the backlog of work in the courts, um, you're going to be looking way, way ahead for a trial. I've just uh, got some figures here from our, our dis, um, designated civil judge in Manchester is on a judge bird. We have here, as of mid-May, small claims track trials backlog of 511 uh, trials waiting to be heard. Fast track, 200 trials. Multi-track, 25 trials. And that's just the backlog. And that was the mid-May, so we're a month on from there now. 
and that will have grown. It seems to me, really, realistically, if you have a case that's sort of floating around mid, mid route through directions, you're not going to be getting on before a judge anyway until well into next year. Um, but what does a valuer do um, if uh, he or she just hasn't got any comparable evidence? Um, the first thing I would say is that I don't think that the, that the absence of any comparables would of itself be a good reason to adjourn a trial. I mean, valuers and county courts just have to do their best with the material that they've got. And in fact, if you think about it, there's quite often, uh, well, not often, but that there are certainly instances that you can think of of cases where there isn't really a comparable for a particular premises subject to the Act. Um, one of the reported cases, I think, is about um, an oil jetty. And, and there, the valuers had to adopt an alternative method of valuation. So they, they, they just have to step back from this and ask the question, well, what, what would this go for? What would these premises command by way of rent if, if you're assuming a date three months in the future? And of course, we don't know what's going to be happening three months in the future. Um, one thing that one, one valuer said to me was that there's plenty of evidence about what's going on in the rental market by way of rent renegotiations. So whilst they're not open market lettings, with a fresh incoming tenant or renewals per se under the Act, there is evidence of, for example, retailers saying to their landlord, right, we want a rent holiday and in return for which we'll put one year on the end of the term or 18 months on the end of the term. So that's the sort of material by reference to which a skilled valuer, in my view, could may, may be able to draw some conclusions. The court does, of course, have power to uh, insert in the new lease a rent review. Uh, that's, that power was inserted into the Act um, in, by the 1969 amendments, I think. It's section 34.2. Um, so in, if the circumstances which are, which are uh, obtaining at the moment continue, you can see that the judge might be attracted by the proposition of um, of setting a very low rent initially, but then uh, inserting a rent review, review uh, not after the sort of normal five years or three years, but say after 18 months. Finally, another way of, of looking at this uh, may be to think about a turnover rent. Now, there are some reports in the press that I've seen of turnover rents forming the basis of rent negotiations now. Um, they're actually much more common in other countries. This, this is a rent which is set by reference to some mechanism of assessing the tenant's turnover. Uh, the landlord and the tenant thereby sort of share in the, in the commercial risks and success of the enterprise. Now I just flag up, I'm not going to go into the whys and wherefores of this, but there is actually a debate um, about whether the court has power under the Act to order a turnover rent. And the gist of that is that one of the statutory disregards is any effect on the rent of the tenant's occupation of the holding. And it's arguable, at least arguable, that, the, that, that by setting the rent by reference to turnover, by definition, takes into account the occupation. I'm not sure that a judge would go with that. It seems to me that, that might apply if you're talking about the amount of the rent, but the principle of turnover might be seen to be a different matter. So those, those are ways that I think the court might approach it. As I say, I don't think that they would simply throw its hands up in the air and adjourn. I don't think a good valuer should be saying, well, I just literally can't, can't come to a conclusion. Just to wrap up then, um, think, this is the most important thing in my view, just think about the judge. Imagine you were the judge in one of these cases. If you don't understand a report, then neither will he or she. Um, experts need to show uh, objectivity. Uh, again, sometimes if they actually make concessions, even in the witness box, it can go down quite well if they're measured and, um, and sensible. 
and uh, just drawing on the experience that I had of dealing with a, a certain case about a, a charity shop um, in Lancaster when I was against uh, my learned colleague who's presently online with us. Don't be surprised if after a full uh, hearing of the evidence, the judge just splits the difference straight down the middle. Um, okay, so I don't know, should we deal with questions, Geraint, should we deal with any questions at the end of the overall session or does, is there anything that arises now? Oh, you're on mute, by the way. Why don't we deal with, deal with them uh, now? If you can stop sharing your screen and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll raise them with you. I mean, just following on from that, that point you made about think judge, um, one point that, that occurs to me is that um, those of us who deal with this sort of work, we may be familiar with things like ITSA and so on and GOAD plans and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so when you said if, if it doesn't make sense to us, it won't make sense to the judge, things may make sense to us as, as property practitioners, but of course, they, we may get a judge who's got no idea about any of this, as much idea about this as, as I might have about a PI case or a family case. Mm. It comes back to your common yeah. sense points, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, there's just one point there about the... Um, so they're all good points, by the way, but just in terms of time, just pick up on one. Interim rent. Uh, yeah, th that, um, the way that works under an unopposed uh, lease renewal is, of course, that the... The rent, the interim rent is presumed to be the new rent. Uh, now, one exception to that, and I think it's section 24C or section 24C, is where there is a, a great difference between the rent as at the earlier date and when the new, new rent is set. And that may well be the case, in fact, here. If, because if at the date when the earliest date when a section 25 notice could have could have terminated the tenancy, um, the rent's on the floor because no one can use the premises at all because it's a restaurant or something. And then by the time you get into trial in 18 months time, it's gone back pretty much to normal. Yes, I think the tenants will be making interim rent applications. It, it, if as I understand it, what they, can, what they can do is they can, for a portion of that time, argue that they should have been paying next to nothing. Um, yeah. Just, just going through these um, questions, uh, I see that um, Mark has, has um, flagged a point that um, says it's not a question but something to be raised. I'll, I'll read it out so that the rest of, of our attendees can, uh, can hear it. It's that um, he, he has noted that valuers tend to ignore confidentiality clauses in relation to side letters um, when you're considering rent. Um, so that's a point to bear in mind. Um, then we've got uh, Julian talks about the possibility of ordering a, a step rent or a step up rent, um, which I suppose is an alternative to um, a rent review. Although we don't, we just don't know what the what the rent's going to do, do we, in the future at the moment with with COVID? Um, and then the the, uh, the final one that I've seen is from Claire right at the start, who said that. Um, She's talking about the um, your comments, Matt, about uh, experts' report, um, and saying it's, it's um, it can be a challenge to get through to an expert. Um, the, the best way in which to produce their report and what sort of things to focus on and, and not to focus on, um, without um, telling the expert what to do. What's um, what's your view about? Hey, what's I've guy? always been quite yeah. robust about this, really. I think you can tell, you can ask an expert questions and you can tell the expert the correct legal approach and the, the correct legal questions that they need to be asking. Uh, you can also deal with your expert about the way the information is presented. What the forbidden territory, if you like, is where you would overstep the mark is if you try to argue about what their actual findings are within their area of expertise. But I, don't, I don't see that there's a problem if, they, if they've sort of pr produced a report which is almost addressing the wrong question um, and not stepping back from things enough, really, and just asking the overall question, which is, look, how much are these, are these premises worth? I don't think there's any problem with asking questions and asking them to put further material in really. 
I suppose it's it's the in the ideal world, would you agree that the thing to do is to you get a draft report from your expert and then have a conference where you can you can yeah. talk about it. You can and in the process yeah. of asking questions, you can gently lead your expert <laughs> the way you want. Well, no, to. I, don't, I mean I think you can lead an expert to the right legal question. I think the other thing is you just need to take a very careful note of the conference that you have as well to avoid any accusation later on. I mean, you do have to be a bit careful, I think, as well as the act. If, you're the ad, if you know that you're going to be the advocate and that you might be dealing, you taking the expert through their evidence when they're in the witness box, you always dread that awful moment when they sort of look at you and say, yeah, but I thought you said in conference that I wasn't supposed to say that. And then, so you do, you do need to be circumspect <laughs> and careful. But I, I think as long as you're just guiding the expert about the correct legal approach not necessarily valuation approach then i don't i don't see there's a problem and keep a careful note yeah the, the, the note saying look this is this is your evidence you've got to be completely comfortable with it you know hmm. yeah so that sort of thing claire um, uh, there's another point there about pact um sorry to answer that question i don't have much experience of using it myself uh, i was going to say actually that's a really good point arbitration is the obvious way forward given the difficulties at court it's a there's a, a special process um uh, uh to, just for these just it's an rics special process just for these things uh, how do you find that compares with the court process um i think you'd probably have to defer on that to, to solicit i think this if it goes to pact it's unlikely to involve me i think is so solicitors may have a better idea on that. Um, how would interim, oh, I don't know. Uh, hey, I'll, I'll pass better leave it there anyway. If anyone wants to email me about any of these points, feel free. The other thing is I do wonder whether it might even be worth having another session on, uh, on these coronavirus type issues uh, and possibly even getting a surveyor to, to, to join with us uh, on a talk to see what their view might be. Yeah, yeah, good plan. Let's see if we get uh, if we can top the five hundred attendee mark for that. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so I'm going to close down the uh, the my view of the chat function. The chat function will still work for um, all of you attendees, um, and um, the uh, I'll get on with um, with my side of, of things now. Matt will be monitoring the the chat so that um, he can pick up, uh, he can raise with me things that, that you would like to ask in due course. Right, so I should be sharing my screen with you at the moment. Um, my talk lends itself less to um, the use of photos than Matt's, unfortunately. Um, I'm talking about um, the duration of the, the, new, the renewal tenancy, break clauses, specifically redevelopment break clauses, um, and certain other aspects of um, certain other terms that are commonly uh, found to be in dispute in these cases. So I'm going to talk about, um, when I talk about other terms in inverted commas, I'm talking there about terms other than the property, the rent uh, and duration. Um, I'm going to, in that context, I'm going to address the leading case of O'May in the City of London. Um, I'm then going to pick up on three specific areas, um, guarantors, not, not AGAs, but um, guarantors more generally, duration and redevelopment break clauses. The talk from me is designed as a high level overview, really. It's, it's hopefully designed to help you with thinking about your own cases by thinking about the, the themes and principles that, that lie behind um, the leading cases. It's not an attempt to be a full statement of the law in these areas um, because of that. So, starting off with um, the residual uh, category of other terms, section 35 is the, the starting point here. So the terms of the, this, this is part of it, the terms of the new tenancy and default of agreements may be determined by the court. And in determining those terms, the court shall have regard to the terms of the current tenancy and to all relevant circumstances. 
So it's immediately clear that, that we're dealing with a potentially wide discretion here with a range of, of potentially relevant factors. In itself, Section 35 doesn't say very much. Um, we have to look elsewhere for guidance. And that's where um, we get to the case of Omey. I'm not going to dwell on these well-known principles because they are so well-known. Um, they're worth touching upon though. So the starting point when you're looking at other terms, um, you identify what the terms of the lease are, the existing lease. The starting point is that the new lease will reflect those terms of the existing lease. And if you want to change the term to those terms, you bear the burden of, prove, of justifying why that should happen. So, the second main principle from OMEI is that any new terms have to be fair and reasonable. And bear in mind that that is a necessary but not sufficient requirement. It's not enough to just say, here's the new term that I want inserted in the lease. Um, it's fair and reasonable, so therefore can I have it, please? It has to be fair and reasonable, but that's not enough in itself. So because this guidance, the, these, these main principles in, in OMA are so broad, the, the real question is how we approach our own cases in light of that guidance in a slightly more sophisticated way. And that, that is, is the aim of, of my talk, really. So we're going to consider the facts of OMA. And a consideration of the facts of OMA is something that, that it's not often done really. Often people just jump straight to a statement of the, um, to a statement of the, of the main principles and then, and then move away from the case again. And I normally caution against too close an examination of the facts um, in areas of law like this as a way, because it, it, it can draw you into an attempt to say, well, this case involved facts that are quite similar to my case, so therefore I should get the same results in my case. And it doesn't always follow, um, because every case is highly fact specific in this area. But the central theme of, of this part of my talk is that if you look at the facts of, of OME and you think about how the court applied them, to the main principles that I've already identified. What that can do is it can equip you with certain tools that you can then use in your own cases. The awareness of the process that the, that the court go, went through in OME and the reasoning that the court used in OME, and not just the knowledge of the principles that, that um, are the headlines, is what gives you that, um, that toolkit. So the facts of OME. The landlord wanted the tenant in the new lease to pay a variable service charge based on actual repair costs. And this was repair costs to the, to the structure of, of a much larger building than the demised premises. So structural repairs um, and also repairs to important uh, plant like lift. That was a change from the existing lease. It was a, a significantly more extensive um, and variable uh, service charge based on actual costs moving forward. And what the landlord said is, okay, well, I recognize that that on the face of it leads to a much greater burden on the tenant, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the rent to compensate for that. So, the rent was X, and from now on, under the renewal, uh, under the renewed lease, the rent will be Y. And that would obviously be a, be a fixed um, rental moving forward. And the expert evidence on this was that a rent at that fixed lower level would be acceptable in the market. So, if this wasn't um, a 54 Act case, and these premises came on the market with the proposed more onerous service charge, then this lower rent um, would be acceptable to tenants seeking those sorts of premises. A change to the service charge of this nature would, according to the expert ev evidence, hugely increase the value of the reversion, an enormous um, increase. The evidence was also that it would increase the marketability of the reversion, that you had a lot of leases like this in the market at the time. And the other relevant fact 
uh, is that this was a, a five-year tenancy. Now, you might think on the face of it, if you didn't, if you'd never heard of, of Omei, uh, you might think on the face of it that, that was a pretty, um, a pretty weighty set of factors in favour of, of the landlord's position. And so the, the court agreed that the landlord's position was reasonable, but, but it, that's not enough. And the fact that there may be leases of this nature in the market, that's not enough either. And then we really get to the, to the key concept of, of this part of my talk, which is the, the, the concept of commercial balance. The tenant here held under, under a five-year lease, would, would, it, would begin, it would be getting a five-year lease. The service charge was gonna cover long-term expenditure, so structural stuff, things to do with the lift. And so the risk, the, the, the way in which the new service charge was going to work was it was going to cast the risk of something going wrong with the structure or with the lift and so on, um, onto the tenant, a five-year tenant, rather than on the landlord. And it's a, it's a House of Lords case, but um, there's a part of, of one of the judgments from the Court of Appeal, um, which was endorsed in, in the House of Lords, that, that I just wanted to mention to you. It's in my main handout that, that you'll be getting subsequently. Um, so it, the Court of Appeal said this, a short-term tenant, such as the plaintiff tenants, is not adequately compensated by a small reduction in rent for the assumption of the financial risks implicit in the maintenance of the structure of an office block. Those risks are proper to be borne by the owner of the inheritance or of a long term of years, but are not appropriate to be borne by one who is in possession for three years and has no further interest save a limited statutory security of tenure. Such risks are indeterminate in amount and could prove to be wholly out of proportion to the very limited interest held by a short-term tenant. So, uh, where does this take us? Can we extract any, any guidance from it? And I, I think the answer is, is yes. If we step back from the fray and step back from the law, ask yourself the question, of your case, what is the fundamental nature of the party's interests in your case? Is this a short-term tenancy or a long-term tenancy? Does the landlord hold the freehold? And then the second question to ask is whether the proposed change to the, the lease affects this fundamental balance between the parties as set out in the original lease. Now, what I mean by that is this that any lease is essentially just a bag of rights and obligations that are held by the parties to it. That combination of rights and obligations translates into a commercial balance that's struck between the, the, the landlord and the tenant. It's not necessarily an equal balance. It can be a lease that's favourable to a landlord or favourable to a tenant. But nevertheless, there will be a commercial balance of some description that's been struck by the original lease. And what we need to do then, it seems to me, is to measure the fairness and the reasonableness of the proposed new term against that fundamental commercial balance that was struck by the original terms of the lease. Some changes won't affect that balance at all, really. They'll be inconsequential. Other changes, though, will involve a really significant change in the balance, uh, in the commercial balance between the parties. And the more significant the change in the commercial balance between the parties, particularly if it's a change that affects the tenant's business, then the harder it will be to succeed in, in getting a change to the terms. And it's also worth ensuring that your lay evidence or your expert evidence thinks about this commercial balance. So your, 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 your lay client should, should think about the impact of the, of, the, of the existing lease and of the proposed lease on the business. The expert should think about that too. So you end up asking yourself questions like this. Um, are these changes that have been proposed by the other side fair and reasonable? Uh, bearing in mind, for example, the tenant's short-term interest in the property. And that's why the change failed in Omei. The market said that the change was okay. There were leases of that kind in the market at the time. It was entirely understandable that the landlord wanted this change. 
but the change upset the risk, it upset the balance of risk between the parties that was struck in the original lease. The change would have exposed the tenant uh, to a risk of, of expenditure, unknown expenditure, um, on long-term things like the structure of the premises, um, which was inappropriate given its short duration lease. So the purpose of the act is not to dogmatically preserve the terms of the original lease. There's nothing magical um, in that in itself. But the preference is given to the terms of the original lease because they reflect the commercial balance that has been struck as a result of the party's original negotiation. And it's that balance that's the bedrock for the tenant's business. And of course, the purpose of the act um, is to protect a tenant's business. So I just want to move on to um, the question of guarantors, as I say, not um, dealing with AGAs in this talk. And I want to do it um, by reference to the case of Cairn Place. So in Cairn Place, the existing lease um, had an alienation clause which required guarantors in the event of, an, of um, an alienation to a limited company. It didn't require guarantors from the outset. So the original tenant was uh, a limited company, but didn't require a guarantor, that there was no guarantor at the outset. In the event of alienation, the landlord was entitled to ask for it. What happened was that during the, the currency of the original lease, the um, the original tenant assigned to a limited company, to a, a, a new co, and the, um, the directors of new co were provided as guarantors. This happened about a year or so before the end of the, of the term. What happened then is that the limit is that new co applied for a new tenancy under the act and the landlord said essentially, okay, but I want, but, but one of the terms that I want in the new lease which is different from the original lease, is that I want from the outset, I want the, the directors of Newco to continue as, as the guarantors. The tenant said no. The tenant said, said that, well, the original lease doesn't contain a requirement like that. And under, uh, as a result of, of OMA, you, the landlord, have to justify um, a change. The, the tenant said it's also, it's not fair to require guarantors because guarantors are third parties, the, the, the directors are not party to this. Um, and it's not fair to, to make me as a, as a business tenant um, rely upon the, the agreement uh, of third parties. The landlord won at first instance and in the, the Court of Appeal. First of all, the court had jurisdiction to require um, that, there be, that guarantors be provided. Um, and then you can the 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 ex the way in which the court decided the case falls into two categories really. There, there's there's a part of the decision that was based on the particular facts of the case, and there was a part of the, of the, the decision that were based on that was based on broader factors. So as far as the fact the, the particular facts of the case are concerned, you can understand really why the, the, the court did what it did because Newco came in um, shortly towards the end of the original term run by these particular directors. Those directors caused Nuco to take the, to, to take the assignment and they, the, the, and they did it at the time when they knew that they'd be asking for a renewal in due course. Um, so it, it doesn't seem too harsh uh, as, a, um, as a proposition that therefore, um, knowing the history of all of this, that they, that they ought to make themselves available to be, direct, uh, to be guarantors again. But the decision goes beyond this. What the tenants were saying was, was that this new lease, is, it's, a, it's going to be a 10 year term. The original lease didn't require guarantors for a full 10 year term. And as it turned out, as it was, the original lease um, only had guarantors in place for about a year. That's a significant change, they said. So the question then is, how does this fit in with this notion of commercial balance that I've been talking about? And if you think about it, the reason is this, that the original lease featured an original tenant and no 
guarantors, the landlord must have been satisfied with the covenant strength of the original tenant. And the landlord took the risk of default by that original tenant. On assignment to Newco, the landlord was entitled under the terms of the original lease to require guarantors. And therefore, as a result of that, the guarantors take the risk of default by the original tenant. And that's the balance that was preserved when the court required guarantors for the renewal lease. Because what happened upon renewal is that the guarantors would remain bearing the risk of default by the new tenants. And the, the need for guarantors bearing the risk of the new incoming limited company was always envisaged under the terms of the new lease, uh, under the terms of the original lease. And therefore, although there was a change, it wasn't a significant change to the commercial balance of risk. So moving on to the question of duration. Duration of lease is dealt with under section 33. The parties consent, can consent to a term beyond 15 years, but if the, in default of agreement between the parties that 15 years is the maximum the court can order, they can order a periodic tenancy. Some relevant factors that go to duration, the duration uh, of the old lease, the length of time holding over, commercial considerations, so does the land, would the landlord have difficulties in reletting after a short term? Uh, would the tenant have any particular factors specific to its business, meaning it requires a longer term? Landlord's um, own occupation, or desire to, to occupy in the future, and the comparative hardship between the parties should a shorter or longer term be granted. Now, you can see immediately that it's difficult to predict what sort of term the court might grant because the circumstances that, that could be taken into account are effectively endless. It's a discretionary consideration, and that's why I refer on the slide better broad guidance only really can be given. So even though Section 33, which deals with, dur with duration, doesn't specifically require the court to have regard to the, to the terms of the current lease, unlike section 35, which I dealt with before. The reality is that a lot of judges do take it as a form of starting point. And the second um, broad principle is, is that the fundamental idea of the act is that the tenants businesses ought to be protected. And so what, the, what that translates to in, in practice is that it can be hard for landlords to um, achieve a term that significantly differs from that which the tenant wants provided that the tenant's desire um, is framed within the context of the need to protect its business. And you can get a feel for the application of section 33 from some of the cases and I'm going to use one as a, as, um, a case study um, I'll, in, I'll outline the facts and the, the rival arguments, and then I'll invite you to, to think about um, what the, uh, the court's decision might have been. Um, the case is, is CBS and London Scottish Properties. The facts were, it was a 10-year under lease. The landlord um, held under a head lease, paying substantial rent to uh, the head landlord. The tenant was due to move out. Um, and was due to move out um, in a year's time. And so that's why the tenant only sought a term of the renewal lease of just about over a year. Landlord wanted 14 years. So there's a huge difference between the parties. So the landlord said that in the event that um, only a short term is granted, there'd be a huge diminution in the value um, of its reversion. It was, um, the expert evidence said that it was somewhere between 90,000 and 200,000 in terms of diminution. The landlord was concerned about the void period. So the landlord's paying rent under the head lease and doesn't want to avoid uh, in a year's time, reasonable enough you might think. Market conditions at the time, 15 year terms with the norm and that no landlord would offer um, one year. This is what the expert evidence was saying. The landlord wanted 14 years, which is broadly in line with the current term of 10 years, certainly closer to it than the, than the, the tenant's one year request. And the landlord said this, that, OK, if you want to leave after a year and you've got a 14 year term, you can assign the residue. 
that shouldn't be too much of a problem. The tenant said, look, we're only doing this because we want an orderly departure for the sake of our business. Um, we have, it might not be possible to assign the residue of the term if, if the market is, is working on 15 year terms and we're gonna have one year or so minus 14 years, or sorry, 14 years minus one year, 13 years or so left, we might not be able to, to assign that so easily. If the tenant said the landlord would have ample opportunity to, to get its ducks in, in a row because of the, uh, it would know a year out um, that the tenant was leaving and that there was no real diminution in value. Now, the reason for that um, is that, that, that they said it was a paper diminution only. The reason is what they said was this, that, that the landlord doesn't actually intend to sell the reversion on the facts of this. And that as soon as the, although the, the, the value of the reversion would go down if the reversion was only subject to a one year tenancy, it will just go back up again to its original value um, as soon as the landlord relets um, on a longer term basis. And the tenant obviously stressed that the purpose of the act was the protection of the tenant. Tenant wins. Didn't get, give you very long to think about that, I'm afraid. Now, what the court said was this, the market forces, so what was going on in the marketplace at the time just wasn't very important at all. The landlord wouldn't be unduly um, prejudiced. The paper um, reduction in, the, in the, the value of the reversion was of no real consequence. And fundamentally, what you need to be looking at is the protection of the tenant's business interests. Now, the thing that's, that I find quite interesting about this case is that there is very little analysis of it. Um, the, sorry, there's very little analysis in the report itself, in the judgment. There's a recitation of the arguments and then a preference is expressed for the tenant's arguments. But I find that instructive in itself because it seems to me that it tells us that the court's inclination is really is to look after the tenant's business. And with that in mind, just turn to the final area that I'm going to talk about, which is redevelopment break clauses. Question being really, how likely is it that our landlord will get a redevelopment break clause into the terms of a new lease where one doesn't exist at the outset in the existing lease? The prospect of redevelopment um, may lead to a short duration term, but, it, but in practice, it can be easier for a landlord to get a redevelopment break clause than, than a, a shorter term. That's the, that sort of element of flexibility um, can be more attractive to the court. So Adams and Green confirms that, that redevelopment is part of the policy of the Act. And we know that from the existence of, of ground F as a mandatory ground for possession. There is a jurisdictional element which you need to consider under this as well. A redevelopment break clause is permissible where the works are a real possibility or on the cards. So if a landlord can satisfy the court that they are a real possibility or on the cards, um, then they are in with a shout of getting the court to exercise its discretion in their favour. So you don't need to establish uh, the prospect of, of redevelopment on the balance of probabilities. You don't need evidence of the same strength as you would need to establish possession, um, uh, to establish a ground F opposition to the grant of a new tenancy. So again, it can be useful to see how um, these principles are applied to the facts of, of a given case. And so I'm just going to look at the Adams and Green case briefly. It's a case from 1978 and, and it, it stresses that the need to balance redevelopment, which is something which forms part of the policy of the act with protection of the tenant's business, which is the other policy of the act. So the landlord seeks uh, a 14 year term, but with a, t a rolling two year redevelopment break and the, the tenant says, well, that's, that's awful for me because uh, how am I supposed to plan? How, how can I, um, that will have a huge impact on, on the course of my business. And um, if I never know whether the landlord's going to be uh, suddenly serving me notice under, under this rolling break clause. The trial judge 
um, as you can see there, ordered a seven year term with no break. That was the, the trial judge attempting to balance things. The landlord wanted 14 years with, with, with the rolling break. The trial judge said, no, I'll give you seven. And maybe then you can, you can um, redevelop, but I won't give you a break clause. And it turns out when it goes to the Court of Appeal, that the, the Adams and Green turns out as a, as a strong case for landlords because the trial judge was overturned on appeal. And what the Court of Appeal essentially said this was that the uncertainty of the tenant or the uncertainty of, uh, over the redevelopment was not determinative. The tenant would have, would have two years notice under the landlord's proposals anyway, which is long enough to get itself sorted out. You don't need to prove intention um, to redevelop in the same way as you do underground. F, just this real possibility of it being on the cards. And the justification um, for that, the justification for this modest threshold um, in terms of pr proving that you might well redevelop in the future is twofold. First of all, you may never break. So if it's not that clear that you're going, that you're going to redevelop, well, you just won't ever exercise your break and so that the tenant can carry on happy days for the tenant. The second justification for this modest threshold is that the act itself builds in a further layer of protection for a tenant because if the landlord exercised the break clause then the tenant can still apply for a new tenancy and at that point if the landlord wants to wants to redevelop, the landlord will have to rely on ground F and prove it to the full ground F level at that stage. And so really where you, where you get to with, with, with redevelopment break clauses um, is that, that um, the court will be very reluctant to allow um, the tenant's business interests to get in the way of, of the landlord's desire to, to redevelop. And so there may be some toing and froing about the, uh, when the, the break would kick in, um, but it's hard to resist um, a redevelopment break clause, it seems to me. And so that then concludes what I wanted to talk to you about. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen now and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. I don't know, Matt, whether you've... Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah so um, got... Reese Baker, hi, hi Reese. Uh, I think he's in Midlands. What I kind? It's a good Welsh name, that. Yes, yes, close to your heart. Mm. What kind of documentation would be likely uh, sufficient to persuade the court to allow a redevelopment break? For example, would something as simple as marketing materials for the redevelopment be enough? Um, well, I suppose it, it, it all depends, really. And if you think about marketing materials specifically it's in the same way that you said before Matt that you, you need to um, you need to think judge it's a similar way of looking at this is you, you, you think trial so you think about how a trial would go ahead and if all a landlord has got is some marketing materials and, they, and there's a witness statement saying we intend to redevelop here's our marketing materials what are you going to do with that well as counsel for a, a tenant I'd be obviously asking for all sorts of other stuff. Now, there's no requirement to provide details of financing, details of, of planning permissions, all this sort of stuff. But I would be, I'd be throwing the absence of all of that at a, at a landlord. But if I was ask, acting for, a, for a, a landlord, I'd be saying, well, this is a, a, land, a party that's gone to the trouble of producing marketing materials. And that, that, doesn't, that sort of thing doesn't always come cheap. If it's a very flimsy, um, document it doesn't really show very much at all um, then you might not be able to satisfy the, the, um, the requirement um, that it's a real possibility as opposed to mere speculation um, but if someone has really gone to town on their marketing materials um, then it might it might indicate that, that they are that they're serious about it um, I suspect that just marketing materials you'd struggle with really because it's it's putting the cart before the horse a little bit um, it seems to be that, that, that you, you would probably want to have a slightly more uh, rounded um, set of evidence um, because every, every bit of evidence that you don't have, it begs the question as to why you don't have it. 
Um, just uh, there was one here from uh, Julian Steele, Mills and Reeve in Norwich, I think. It says, what is your view on the ability of the parties to agree a commencement date, given the prescriptive nature of Section 64? Is commencement date a term of the new lease? Um, I don't know. I, I just had a quick look at this. And well, actually, I was using my own knowledge. Um, for the, but uh, no, I, th I think the answer to that is no, the commencement date is set. If the court orders a new lease, the commencement date flows from section 64 and sections 24, 25 and 26. There's an order that you get when you get a new lease. There's a, a form that you're supposed to use, which was established in one of the older cases, mm. which really sets the length of the lease by reference to when it ends. So I think it is the uh, former in your question, prescriptive nature. Um, um, can a tenant with favourable terms uh, in an old lease reasonably insist on a renewal lease by reference to the old, as opposed to a new lease altogether, which is from uh, Keith Songhurst, um, who, who puts that question, I think you, that's one for you, Geraint. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that the, that puts me in mind of, of um, some of the things that you were talking about, actually, Matt, the, the, you get those cases with the, with the restrictive user clauses, where what people are trying to do sometimes is to, is to have an impact on the rent, um, using the other terms to try and uh, try and impact the rent, uh, but fundamentally, that you, you you come back to the starting point, which is that the, the terms of the um, that it, it's not really incumbent on the person who wants to stick with the the existing terms to justify them. <laughs> it's the other way around. The person wanting to change it um, is the person wanting to uh, is the person needing to um, to justify it. Um, so it, they, they bear the, the burden of doing that and mere modernisation um, isn't always enough. Um, Claire Elaine Arthurs, who's at Gunna Cook, says, are you finding that judges are willing to take into account the uncertainties caused by COVID when using their discretion on terms and breaks, coming across some arguments for shorter terms and short breaks on that basis? Yeah, I mean, the... The short answer to that is that I haven't fought one of these since um, the COVID outbreak. Um, but you and I were talking about this um, this week, weren't we, Matt? And, and yeah, um, I think it's it's the I'm in I'm slightly in two minds about it, really, because at one level you think to yourself, well, as soon as you've got the the, the COVID crisis, instantly you're going to be you're going to be thinking about breaks and about short about short duration leases but if you think about you know imagine a, a, a short, what you might normally consider to be a short duration lease of say two years two years is another world away from from where we are now potentially um this oxford uh, university vaccine they've been talking about producing two billion doses of this vaccine um by next year who knows this the situation could be hugely different so tenants are experiencing huge difficulties in the in the very much short term and there may be uh, there may very well be um, longer term implications in terms of a, of, a, of a recession but as for whether lockdown type restrictions cause are, are likely to cause ongoing um, difficulties for, for tenants in the um, beyond the immediate so into the, the medium term no one really knows um, I suppose when you've got when you've got a lease renewal and, and, and if it was before a judge, you, by definition, you've got a tenant who wants a new a new lease. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to envisage, isn't it? Tenants, in fact, discontinuing claims for a new lease simply because they don't want the premises anymore. Yeah. I mean, on the assumption that they want a new lease, I think I mean, I think you just have to apply the basic test. Probably, I suppose the courts may well be more flexible. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have thought that the, the, the court's sympathy, just as a gut reaction, not having fought one of one of these in the current climate, as a gut reaction, I imagine that, that the um, the sympathies of the courts would tend to lie with with tenants. Um, although, you know, if you're acting for a, for a landlord, you're going to be stressing the risk of a void. Um, you know, 
one year. I should say as well, I mean, I, I would echo what you're saying about everything. There, there hasn't really been any court work of, of this nature, really, since this started, because the courts effectively shut down at the beginning. I was watching one of these sessions as well uh, with Wilberforce Chambers and their view from said the central London court was very much the same. That was their experience there too. So uh, in terms of what judges are doing, it's anybody's guess, but I think they will be flexible. Yeah. Um, uh, on a redev break, what is a likely notice period? It, it, there's, a, there's an element of, of how long is a piece of string um, with that. Um, the um, court will, will given that, that, that the court, have, particularly with redevelopments, you have these two very much opposing key principles and objectives of the act. So the policies that they talk about, you've got the protection of the business and you've got the, um, and you've got the, the court's desire not to stymie redevelopment. Um, Things that, that a six month um, break clause, for example, is pretty disruptive for a tenant. And I think you, you, you would be doing well to persuade a judge um, of that. Um, in, the, um, in the Adams and Green case, it, it was two years and that was, that was enough for the, for the judge to think, well, uh, for the Court of Appeal rather to think that that, that is, is sufficient for the, the tenant to, to sort itself out. I suppose a lot will depend on the nature of the business, how, how, how set up in the premises um, the tenant is. If it's a, a small retail um, unit run by a sole trader, um, they would be, it would perhaps be easier for them to get out quickly than someone who's firmly dug in with an awful lot of equipment. Yeah, don't, don't forget as well, I think, that uh, as I re recall, the break clause has to be exercised in accordance with the Act. Mm. And so there, there's the minimum notice requirement, isn't there, under the, under the service of the Section 25 notice? Um, yeah. Because because the Act still applies, you still have you still have to, um, to terminate it in accordance with the provisions of the Act. Yeah, and that that can be overlooked. So there's, so, there's still the the six to twelve months, any anyway, isn't there under the under the service of the Section 25 notice. Mm. And then there's one here about competition law. Hang on. How would the court deal with competition law restrictions introduced since the existing lease, i.e. one of the parties cannot legally agree to a provision anymore, uh, but the other doesn't want to change it? Would that be to do with the COVID thing? So. I'm not sure what the context of that is. Perhaps if Sally was to, um, I'm not sure what competition law restrictions are being re referred to there. Perhaps it's something to do with COVID. Would you just defer that one? Certainly, Sally, if you want to give us a drop us an email or put another message on now, uh, by all means do. And then Tim says, to what extent would it be reasonable to insist on renewal on renewal on a rent deposit by way of security where a tenant is subject to a CVA, no rent deposit or guarantee an existing release. <laughs> um, I don't know off the top of my head, let me think. Um, well, yeah, I think some of these will have to shoot from the hip, but I, yeah, well, could, we can deal with that on the email, can't we? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, the, the initial, the initial thought on that um, would be that, that to an extent you take your tenants as you find them. Yeah, I suppose if circumstances have changed, though, it might be something that they'd be willing to to put in, even though it wasn't there originally. Um, hang on, we've got one back from Sally again. Certain retailer cannot agree to new user provisions i.e. a particular user provision was legally compliant when existing these granted but wouldn't be legally compliant now. I suppose again you just have to go back to the to, to the to the overall test uh, with that. Um, I mean if something genuinely would be unlawful I can't imagine the court's going to be um, particularly keen to uh, to grant it in a similar sort of that you'd have similar arguments to those you, that you get potentially in um, 
in specific performance cases, um, if specific performance of a, of a particular uh, agreement would lead to, for example, a breach of contract, and the court's not very keen on doing it. Okay. Right. Sally, if you want to um, send us an email anyway. Oh, hang on. Very helpful. Okay. I'm not sure it was, but there we are. <laughs> Can we do our best? <laughs> Um, but by all means, anybody who wants to send anything in, we're more than happy to have a look at. Um, uh, so is there anything else that we need to deal with? I think we've gone on a bit, haven't we? So an hour and a half. Um, as I said, there seemed to be some, some interest in having another talk to deal with the COVID aspects of it. So um, I did speak to a, a valuer. Uh, in the week in the run up to this, and it might be useful to get the view from the coal face um, mm. in a short further session. So we'll see if there's any interest in that. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else to say. I don't know if you do, Geraint. No, nope, no, nope, that's everything from me. Um, handouts will be, it can be emailed out. Um, so most of what I said is in mine, not the brilliant pictures, of course. Um, so anyway, thanks very much, everyone. I, yeah. Almost enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone, for coming along. Bye. Bye now. Yeah.